if I have any mantra that I say before a take, it's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because that opens something up in mm. me. Because I know if I do know what I'm going to do, the work's not going to be as good as if I have the bravery to step into the unknown and like feel it out. Because as soon as I know what I'm going to do, I miss the the fluid, the, the, the juice of the scene because I'm, I'm, I have blinders on because I'm going to do my thing. There's got to be an unknown element for it to be magical, for it to be the art form. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Josh Pice is an actor. I sat down with him at his home in New York City to talk about the work. Is there a typical first step you take? The part is yours. There's no more persuading anyone that you can do this. Now it's time to do what you have to do before you arrive on the set. Is there a typical first step? The first steps may be different, but really what I'm after is to get to a place where I can be spontaneous. And it's how, in a sense, can I trick my nervous system so that I'm listening to my impulses as opposed to listening to my mind. And my mind will come up with, oh, I'm gonna say this line this way. You know, oh, this would be a great way to say this line. But time after time, uh, when I'm on set and I'm filming something, I would say, a large part of the time, I'll be pretty much in the moment and spontaneous. But then I'll have an idea about, oh, this line I'm going to say just like this, and it's going to be amazing. And we'll kind of finish the take, and the director, this has happened to so many times, the director comes over and was like, yeah, that was, that was really good. But um, this one line, um, I don't know. I like, it. like, you know. And so it's... Um, it's how can I get to a spontaneous place where I can, in a sense, party in the unknown. And so that's where I get to. And yeah. typically how I get there is through my body and through, you know, questions. And sometimes it's, Sometimes I can read a script and something happens in my body and it's not a, you know, an intellectual, it's not a process, it's just intuition kicks in and I've got it. And sometimes it requires exploration and the, you know, I'll ask, you know, the kind of questions I'll ask myself will be, um, you know, is the character... What's the character's relationship to the ground? Is, is he very grounded and rooted mm -hmm. into the ground? Is he not connected to the ground at all? Is his energy very forcefully directed forward? Or is his energy chaotic? Is, does his energy flow? Is his, is his, does he have an open heart? Is he closed? Is he armored? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and does he have a big kind of energetic presence like energy emanating beyond his body that's almost like welcoming like welcome to my living room or is his energy holding uh space like don't enter my space or is his energy very inside doesn't really exude past his body is it very internal where it's almost like he's caving in on himself or is it internal and is like has no sense of space like somebody that could just walk up and stand really close to you and talk to you and and that's normal so it's like these are some of the things that i'll look at to make a shift in the energetic pattern in my body with the intent to stimulate my imagination and creativity so that I'm not operating from my mind. So it's in a sense, 
taking my intellectual ideas and attempting to convert them to spontaneous organic behavior. Yes. There's too much there to parse out <laughs> already. Before, before I forget, the, so when you intellectualize the idea that you decide, okay, this person's energy is all within, he's not emoting the, the you know, that's the wrong word, but whatever you were just saying about. Like, you know, it, his like the energetic present. Like yeah, some people, yeah. their energy is right. enormous and some people, their I mean, energy I know is, exactly what you mean. you know, is. So when you decide on that, though, how, like, because you're, you're just intellectualizing that in a way. You're, you're making the choice on that. You're, you're, you're sizing it up based on the script, based on the character, mm -hmm. based on what you, what do you, do you literally do some kind of energy work to, 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 to embody that? Or are you just thinking that he's like that and then that brings you in, into that space? You know what I mean? Like what, because, well, because if we watch you, if we watch you, we, we see you. As you're saying this, I'm thinking of things, you in movies and TV, you're, you're different. Your actual pr uh, posture, your presence is different. And now I'm seeing what you're talking about based on what you're just telling me right now. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. But, but so, I, it, I mean, it, you know, said, is it energy work? Say, you know, um, yes, it, 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 it is. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's nothing mystical, but, um, you know, anybody, anybody can do this. It just takes a little practice of just, you know, if you just stand still, still and go like, how can I send my energy to fill the room? Mm -hmm. You know, anybody mm -hmm. could do that. Mm -hmm. And we, we all, human, humans make, you know, based on their, you know, how they were raised, based on decisions in life. And a lot of this is very unconscious, but humans make decisions on how much energy they exude out and sometimes they don't you know a lot of this mo most people may not be aware of it but you know you could you know we could walk out on the street right now and you could say oh yeah that person has a lot of energy around them that person doesn't you know i've just trained myself you know maybe it's because i grew up in a very dangerous neighborhood and i had to be very aware of who was safe and who is not safe and had to really assess, mm -hmm. um, you know, which way to walk down the street because people were getting killed. And, you know, I grew up in Alphabet City mm -hmm. in New York and, you know, it was very tough and you had to be aware of what yeah. was going on in the street. And people who live in Alphabet City now may not understand what you're talking no, about. No, they're, now they're like, this is great. Yeah. You know, where do you want to go for brunch? You know, when I was growing up, it was all, it was heroin and acid was, you know, and I saw people, you know, doing acid and like jumping, you know, thinking they could fly off buildings and, you know, and, but it was also incredibly creative. It was, everything was exposed, it, you know, everything was raw. There was an incredible sense of community if you were a part of it. But coming in from the outside, you were putting your life in your hands right. for sure. Right. Now, somewhere I read that in your training, I think it was in Syracuse, right? My initial training. Okay. But I did a lot of training after that. Yeah, that's what, like, something about your introduction to Stanislavski there mm -hmm. didn't sit right with you. Is that, is that fair to say? Well, it made a lot of sense. Like, it was like, oh, you you're in this scene you think about something that happened to you that's similar to this scene and you kind of bring that up and do the scene bringing that up and trying to integrate it and it seemed like yeah that makes a lot of sense and basically what happened was i had a teacher um, th also at Syracuse, who had just come back from working with this guy in Poland named Jerzy Grotowski or Grotowski. And that work, and she introduced us to this work, which was very physically based. It was very much about accessing impulses and 
getting so profoundly connected to your body um, that I'd never experienced that kind of connection. Maybe I'd never experienced what it was like to actually be present. I'll put it that way. And by that, I mean connected to my body, connected to my immediate environment, and not listening to a running commentary in my head. Mm -hmm. And after being introduced to that work, I was, I, then later as I would go into like a scene study class, I'd be like, wow, I, it's like everything was just available. Like the pores were open. I didn't have to, I didn't have to plan and manipulate and work so hard. And, you know, and I think in, in the lineage of actor training, like where Stanislavski came in was like, you know, how can actors have real emotion? Because that wasn't happening. And so, you know, for his time, um, it was a, a profound, uh, you know, growth in actor training. I feel like in the era that we're in now, people want spontaneity, they want truth, and they don't want manipulation. Mm -hmm. Like, n nobody wants to see that. And, yeah. you know, like, I mean, what comes, you know, to mind for me is, uh, you know, Joaquin Phoenix. Like, yeah. you know, I worked with him in Joker and so in his body, so spontaneous, so you don't know where he's, what's going to happen. And that's, yeah. you know, and it's truthful and, and that's what, that's what audiences want today. So, you know, going back to after that initial exposure to that and how it affected my whole system, I, I went after college on a real journey you know, training with people from all over the world, directors mm -hmm. and different actor, you know, actor training, people, different kinds of actor training to see how could I make spontaneity something I could count on? How could I make it more accessible to me as opposed to something like a fluke? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so that's, you know, so that was... That's been my, you know, my journey, yeah. you know, is, is how can it be truthful, spontaneous, impulsive, and, you know, support the script. Right. And tell the story. It, it seems like a, a, a typical set is not necessarily a good petri dish for spontaneity. Or is that not true? Meaning, like, you might be feeling very present, and, uh, and, and of course they have to change the light, and it takes 10 minutes, and then by that time somebody annoyed you, and you're, you're out of it again, and then, but now it's time to go. Yeah, but, but from my point of view, like my job is to tell the truth. It's not to manipulate myself into what I think from my mind's point of view is better. So even if I'm momentarily annoyed, like what, it, you know, if we break down what is annoyance, it's an energy in your body. But that's my truth in that moment. And if I work from that, it's not like I'm trying to show I'm annoyed, but there's an energy that's, ha that's happened. Yeah. And if I create with that, I'm doing my best work. If I'm feeling like whatever I interpret as, you know, annoyance, which is, like I said, I've, it's something I feel in my body, and I'm trying to hide that, mm -hmm. it's, I'm not doing my best work. And even if the character is happy, you know, let, let's say, yeah. you know, but there's, but if I'm still creating from that charge, I'm in the context of a story and it'll, it all comes together. And it's sometimes more interesting. Basically, you know, don't want to put a mask on what's happening. Right. And, and also if, if you honor exactly where you are, it will shift in seven to 12 seconds. If you try to hide it and contain it, like let's say you feel annoyed and you're trying to do the scene, then you're putting all this energy trying to yeah. hide this energy, this annoyance, and, just stays there. and then you're dis, you know, and then you're, it, then everything gets discombobulated. I always say you want to ride it, not hide it. Yes. You know, you want to ride the energy that's there because that's always the truth. That's always the, that's the gold. Yeah. And if we disconnect from the body, from my point of view, yeah. 
it be nobody wants to see it. People want truth yeah. and spontaneity. They don't want, you know, I would say 10, 15, 20 years ago, like acting was more about, you know, a magnificently, uh, I don't know, the word manicured, yeah. bravado performance yeah. was like, wow, that's, yeah. you know, that was great. But the, you know, times have changed yeah. and, yes. you know, maybe, you know, we just, you know, you turn on the news and it's like, and we're looking, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? And the same, you know, I think for actors, it's almost like we're competing against a, a, a YouTube video of a drunk woman standing on a table and falling over because it's so true. And so we're drawn to it. It's like, mil you know, <laughs> millions of clicks. And we have to, as actors, you know, we have a truth that's always there. It's always changing. And, it's, and, yeah. and if we create from that, you know, I feel like that's what, uh, from my point of view, of course, yeah. that, you know, that's what is compelling yes. uh, to, you know, in the art form today. And it doesn't have to be the equivalent of falling off the table because if you're true I'm just speaking as an audience member now if you're true it could be a micro moment and I'm captivated just as much as I was about for that woman that fell off the table exactly yeah yeah but, but when, when, we, when we get in front of the camera we we, we forget that or something or, or well if you go in front of the camera you know um, there tends to be an increase in body sensation and that's where there's a higher tendency to try to shut down <laughs> the our system because because there is an increase in energy but mm. it's all creative fuel it's all good mm. it's all good what about if the actor you're acting with is just dead, is just not present, and is like worse than that. It's just you're bouncing stuff against a hard wall and the ball's just like not even bouncing back. It's like being absorbed into the wall. What on earth? And you must have had that happen. I'm sure you did. It's okay. So somebody is, you know, let's say they're shut down. They're disconnected from themselves they they don't want to be there um and that's your partner it's like that's a that's something right there like if you play with you know and that's how most you know most human interaction involves a situation where one person is more open than the other you know it's only like actors in mostly in in some kind of an acting class, not like my class, but you know, where everybody is like, eyes are open and they're staring into each other's eyes and they're, you know, and they're, um, you know, and they're really connected. Like that's not, you know, most human behavior involves disconnecting and trying to shut down because we don't wanna be out of control. Well, that's what you work with. You work off of that that person's not there. You just operate off of what's there. And if then the director comes and gives a note based on this chemistry of these two people, you might need to change your chemistry. But there's no point, you know, that person's, you know, wherever they're at. Mm -hmm. And to fight against it is only going to for me to fight against how my scene partner is operating is only going to put me in my head and pull me out as well. Yeah. And it could be really interesting, you know, and I, I also, I, it could be really interesting to have that, you know, that going on. And I've also made a choice, depending on a character, to be really not present and to be really judgmental and to really be disconnected from myself as a choice yeah and then that creates a whole behavior as well as soon as you said that i'm imagining you in touchy feely mm -hmm. when you're handing the wine to ellen page 
just the handing of the wine, the way you handed her the wine. Yeah, I mean, he, that's a guy who's so shut down. Yeah. You know, but but playing with that shut downness, um, you know, and you know, playing with I was playing with you know my upper body being compressed down and my lower body being compressed up and and not wanting you know to like prob you know somebody that feels probably maybe as a child felt so much and then learn mm -hmm. you know learn couldn't handle it and shut came up with a technique to kind of keep himself shut down mm -hmm. but that just playing with that triggered my imagination so much that I I I don't know what quite what you're referring to with like I didn't plan however yeah. it was that I had yeah. but just having that alive in me allowed me to hand the wine however however I did which I yeah. don't remember yeah. but um, but I'm I'm happy that I have I'm happy that stuck out to you yeah and it and and it was also you know her uh, kudos to her too the way she grabbed it. it it grabbed it like almost like why are you handing me this I mean I've I've been in moments like this it's like why is this guy why isn't this guy just put it on the table right why am I <laughs> right but not even aware that that's that that's wrong or something. yeah like, not there right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, what kind of director works best for you now that you have this, this down, not now that you have a way of working, is it, is, is a hands-off director better for you or do you need specific, uh, input from a, a certain kind of director and can you describe that? It's really case by case. I mean, I, um, you know, you, you mentioned touchy feely, like working with um, Lynn Shelton on that. You know, was very collaborative, and that that movie actually came out of us meeting at the Tribeca Film Festival years earlier, and us both being enamored of each other's work, and like, let's make something, let's make a movie, let's. And so it came out of us brainstorming together, you know, like this character and and other ideas that she had. Um, and so it was very like juicy and, and like very integrated and delicious, you know, like just like so yeah. fun, uh, and collaborative. And then there's other times where there's some like really seasoned di directors and they, and I think they feel that they've cast me and that's a big part of their job and they're going to see what happens and then and a lot of times um you know i'll i'll say and it's like truthful it's like i don't quite i don't know what i'm gonna do um and and then they might kind of be like well let's pull this back let's move this over a little bit and um so you really don't know what you're gonna do like you don't you don't even you don't even i have a trajectory but i don't each take mm -hmm. you know it's if I have any mantra that I say before a take, it's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> because that opens something up in mm. me. Because I know if I do know what I'm going to do, it's less, it's going to be, the work's not going to be as good as if I have the bravery to step into the unknown and like feel it out and because as soon as I know what I'm going to do, I miss the oh, the yeah. fluid, the 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 juice of the scene yeah. because I'm I'm I have blinders on because I'm going to do my thing. Yeah. And and however, I'll say, you know, if you're creating a character that is like determined and moving forward no matter what, you know, you, you still play that but how that being relates with these other energies of these other people um will can't uh, there's got to be an unknown element for it to be magical for it to be the art form you make actors come alive phil seymour hoffman synecdoche new york i always loved your scene can you just tell me about this scene I didn't know the scene was going to unfold the way it did. And starting out, you know, my career doing law and order, you know, it, yeah. like as a medical examiner where, you know, it, everything was like, yeah. um, you know, 
I thought, oh, maybe it's going to be kind of like that because it's like a medical scene. And yeah, and Charlie Kaufman was like, like he just encouraged there to be breath in the scene. And like, and I think one thing that's powerful about the scene, and it also happens, you know, with doctors is like, they'll talk to you and then they'll write something down. And it's almost like the longer that they write something down, um, the more worried you get. Like, yeah, it's like, what is going on? And so, like, almost playing with, like, really looking at him like a specimen, almost like I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm assessing everything that you're doing patiently, and, like, I know better, you know, almost like that medical thing that doctors can sometimes have, where they're, like, in their into their own genius, yes. you know, about a- assessing a situation which has, does not make the patient feel good in right. any way. Um, and, and so kind of just started playing with that and just, yeah. you know, looking at him, not, you know, looking at him as uh, for, you know, what potential diseases he could, yeah. he could have as opposed to, uh, you know, having a conversation. It's yeah. like looking at him like a specimen. Yeah. Yeah. And almost playing th- with that, I think in Phil, it, you know, I think it generated some discomfort f- yeah. for him, which was, you know, yeah. perfect for yeah. the scene. And He didn't overdo it, though. He, no, he, yeah, it was just... That was, that's why it was great, too. Yeah, and it was just, you know, it was... It was it was mad. It was like a, you know, we were just like in this yeah. little zone and yeah. it just felt like, you know, it, one of the great feelings, I think, experiences as an actor is like when you feel like you can't go wrong, like you're just in this dance, yeah. you know, and you're in it and you're not in your head. And, um, and that's, you know, where... You know, I feel like that was hap- that's what's happening in that scene. When scenes are this short, when, when your character is so on screen for so little time and you're going in and it's probably half a day's work or, or a day's work, do you think about who this guy is? Like, you just said, like, you know he's, um, he's kind of into himself and everything. Are there just some times, though, when you think, you know what, it's no, there's no point to really, like go into this guy's whole backstory i'm going to be present i'm going to be there and i'm going to um say it spontaneously and it's going to have that feeling of depth you know part of the thing i've learned recently is that someone could say something in a certain way without anything behind it but it can give me the illusion that it had has the depth and like and and that's not even a pejorative i'm not even saying that pejoratively I'm saying that like that's another way to get me the truth, you know? Like I can I can think about my uncle, you know? Yeah. Because of that. But it's not like he went in and wrote down reams and reams of of backstory of this mm-hmm. necessarily. I mean, when I started out, that's what I I would write, you know, tons of backstory, you know, and it was it was partially out of fear. Like, oh, Mm -hmm. like if maybe if I do this, like maybe it'll sink in. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, but it's really the result, end result of that. Not that you necessarily always have to do that, um, but the end result is how does this being live now? You know, I used to do all that work, but I, Ne- it never really came through. It was like, well, mm. I guess that's what they said to do, you know. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. Or I heard somebody else does that. Maybe it'll work for me. But it, it's, you know, again, it's like, you know, I, early on, I I did a uh, a pincher play called called the Caretaker, mm. and you know, it was playing this character who had had shock therapy and was now living in this abandoned building and and you know there's reference to the floor being really weak and i was like 
writing about like what, what the shock therapy must have been like and you know trying to and then one day in rehearsal I, I the there were, I really heard a line that somebody else said about how weak the floorboards are and I just started in rehearsal just started walking on the floor as if I could fall through like as if the ground was not stable and just playing with that my relationship again to the ground and that the ground was not safe and not secure and I could fall through it triggered my entire nervous system and my being and had the impact of somebody that was uh had had that kind of you know shock treatment so ultimately it's got to get to like how does this being relate now it, the truth is always there, and it's always the right thing. And I sometimes say in my class that there's an acting goddess that is always giving you the right thing to feel in the exact moment that you're about to create. Of course, actors constantly battle with that because it's it's so counter to to you know to everything because well, I if, you know if the character is this then right and uh, we already talked about this but like whatever my whatever my truth is in that moment can work even though you don't think it it is it is fitting in with the truth that you think the scene has yeah and you know like the classic example that'll come up in class it'll be you know well what if I'm really happy and giddy you know and and I'm playing a scene where I'm at a funeral. Yeah. And it's like, that would be devastating to see somebody like giggling at a funeral. Like you would be like, oh my God. The, the, you know, you'd either be like, they are so fucked up or they're in so much pain or whatever. <laughs> it would just tr- fire your imagination. Yeah. You know, right. it would be so compelling to watch right. Right. somebody right. giggling hysterically and not being able, you know. Yeah. The only thing that doesn't work is is untruth, right? I mean, yeah. that's that, I mean, that's the only thing that that doesn't fit. We have to r- recognize that people are hungry for something truthful, you know, in this era that we're in. And you know, what's great about that is that there's always truth is always there, you know. Yeah. And it takes some practice sometimes to to access it. You know, to access like, well, what is that? What am I, what's my experience right now? Not that it's, you want to be, nobody wants to see an actor be indulgent, but it's like, it can just be like a little energetic charge. And if you just create from that, it's going to unfold and unfold and unfold and unfold. The first line in Carol Baker's autobiography, which she was on the show and I, and I, I read it to her, is I am always inside my head or something like that. And I said to her, you know, I think I would be a pretty good actor if I wasn't always inside my head. And she said, oh no, that's what makes you a good actor, being inside your head. And it's so interesting to sit down with you right now after researching you a little bit. When she was saying it, I was thinking, no, this is not true. I don't know what kind of alien she is because she's amazing and it's just whatever, it's true for her. But you would disagree with this, right? You can't be inside your head. Well, it's, I would say this, there's times when we are in our head, right? You, you, and that's your truth in that moment. <laughs> yeah. So... If you're in your head, like acknowledge and create from that you're in your head. Mm. I would say my baseline that I'm aiming for, for my system, my being, is to be in my body, to be connected to my immediate environment. And as soon as I'm in my head, um, I, I recognize it and shift my attention back into my body keep my breath going and connect to what's actually in front of me. Cause that for me opens the creative channel. 
because if I listen to what's in my head, it's like either you're doing great or this sucks, mm-hmm. both of which are not valuable, you know? Right. And sometimes thinking you're, you're doing great can, can be worse. How I see it is it, to the extent that an actor is in their head um, is relative to how much the audience will be in their head. When the actor is really in their body, really present, spontaneous, it pulls, it activates the audience's imagination to fill in everything. The more present we are, the more the imagination of the audience fires up. The more calculated and in our head we are, we might, the audience might go, oh, that was good, you know, as opposed to like, being fully engaged. So committed impulse is your class. And a lot of these things you're talking about, I'm assuming is what you're teaching in this class. Yes, yeah. yeah. When did you start this? And, and was this just realizing like, I need to share this? I actually never planned to teach. Um, you know, like I said, I went on this journey of seeking out teachers from all over the world and just to see how I could understand what is spontaneity, how can spontaneity be something that can be, that I can count on, that I can access, that I can, that's not so um, unknown. And, and I was part of a theater company called Circle Rep, um, and which and they had a lab company which was like a small black box and the people at circle rep said you've just been on this journey you know for a couple years of exploring all this stuff why don't you direct and lead people using what you've what you've learned and i was like that sounds great and so um for about over, it was about a 13 month period. I had a group of actors and we, I started, you know, directing them. And I re, uh, what I really wanted was I wanted it to feel like, uh, not to feel, I, I wanted it to be like, this is ha- what they're creating is happening in this moment. Mm-hmm. And they kept bringing in like a locked version. Look, here's what I've got. And, and, and then as the rehearsal would go, it would be kind of come deader and deader and more locked and more safe mm-hmm. and secure to them. And so I started experimenting. They were, everybody was really game. of like, how can we get it so that it's, you're actually creating it in this moment, mm-hmm. not recreating it. Mm-hmm. And so I came up with exercises and we experimented and I infused what I had been learning and then periodically, you know, part of the deal with Circle Rep is every three months that like do an open presentation of your process and, and of some of the exercises and, and where we were in this piece that we were creating. And the work was stunning and spontaneous and people were like, wow, this is so exciting. And, and from that, people started asking me to teach. And it, like some people from NYU were there and they said, can, can I start teaching at NYU? I was like, I'm not a teacher, you know, I don't, and I, you know, and I kept going, no, I, I, I don't even know what, I don't know how to teach. I have no idea. And, but it was, at some point, you know, it was like the universe was going like, teach, come on, yeah. teach. And I was like, okay, you know, mm-hmm. I'll give it a shot. And, um, and I just love it you know i just Mm -hmm. i i it's and i treat it like a laboratory of like how can we you know in every class that i teach you know i i have to always think like what what's exciting for me like what's the next next piece of this work to to go deeper and to get people you know into a place of spontaneity and and embodiment and inhabitation, you know, faster and faster um, so that they can integrate it and, you know, go flourish in in their careers. Mm -hmm. So it was not something I ever planned to do, um, but it's something, 
you know, I, I love to do. And, and sometimes I almost feel like I'm, I'll be on set, you know, working myself and I'll be like, oh, this would be great to like bring into class. And, mm. and so it's very, um, you mean like looking at your surroundings, looking at the environment yeah. and just using it as, a, as an example. Yeah. Or something, or I'll see how another actor is working that is like, oh, that would be that's great and from you know it's like i'm so lucky to witness this and then mm-hmm. and then i get to you know share it in my classes like and, a laboratory and i see like a mean, laboratory yeah, it's like so bringing it's, the specimen back to the lab yeah exactly <laughs> it's exactly that if you can write your future out and live it how what would that be such a lame question like that i mean my desire is to use all of me up like not to feel like like okay. like there was something like ah oh, if only you know and i may not get used up in you know some you know i don't know high paying lead role and in you know that may not be it but i'm you know it or it it could be but it's ultimately it's feeling like my creative all my creative juice gets to be gets to you know i just get to create and create you know and and just just to just to keep creating and and to um you know more complex in you know roles where there's you know where where the character is shifts you know over time and um bottom line is um you know when i started out i was like i want to be a working actor i want to make a living as an actor and i want to be respected as by my peers like that was like when i was you know just out of acting school it's like that's my goal you know and and you know i feel like i've i've achieved that and 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 now I just want to keep just being challenged and just and have fun and do funny. I like material that's, you know, like I'm working on Ray Donovan. I've been recurring on that, yeah. you know, since the first season. It's in the seventh season now. And, you know, it's just a character that it's so funny. It's like the, what this guy goes through. It's like somebody who's got everything and is just miserable, you know, and is like trying to feel important you know any way you can and gets like sexually obsessed with this one and that one and um and it's just so it's it's so much fun to work on um so it's just just and i feel like you know i get to like dig in and 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 so it's just to um to create you know just to create i want to direct and i want to teach like then I feel like I'm I'm using myself, you know. Josh Pice. Thank you so much for this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. It was really fun. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.